So, hello everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, the title of the presentation, and maybe we can start from there, is actually the most cliche that could be, but it's on purpose. Uh, it's, a, it's a total ripoff of a presentation that basically changed my, my career, in a sense. Because um, pretty much as Chris has been saying, the good thing about actually being here today is actually that after so many years, I can actually tell what I'm doing. Because it has been very hard to actually say, what do we do? Uh, <clears throat> so instead of actually, I mean, the whole idea behind the, the service design to me is actually more a concretization of my own work. It's very easy to explain now what I do. Um, what I really love to do is actually to design meaningful interactions or meaningful experiences. This is the, the thrill of my life. This is what I've been doing. Um, I started as a computer science student. Uh, I, actually, I studied artificial intelligence, which is very far away from where I am today. Um, <clears throat> but in a sense, it never fulfilled me. Uh, because I failed uh, to understand how we could connect more with people. There was something that was broken, so I did a lot of user experience part, I did a lot of usability, and lately I actually did a lot of product development. And what I'm trying to actually put on this presentation, uh, and I hope that it's more or well a good story, is kind of the sum up of all the experiences that I've been collecting and the learnings that I found on the way. Um, what I also, the, the, the next slide that I'm going to show you is a little bit because this field is actually not new at all. Uh, we've actually been talking about experience for quite some time. Uh, one of the, the, the most important references that I found is this article called The Experience Economy that actually basically says that the business as they are, they can actually not continue to be as we've been. We need to focus on the experience. It's from 1998, so it's quite some time ago. So the thing is actually, uh, what this, 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 this article actually says is actually that we need to basically orchestrate the experience of the user. We need to start actually planning how the user actually interfaces with our services and products and how actually it comes to happen, the emotional connection towards us. Um, they, they actually, on the, not all the article, they explain the idea behind the commoditization of products and how we actually are actually living on what they call the experience economy. This is where I actually find myself today. Um, most of the companies that I've been working with, uh, today they face a problem. The product differentiation is non-existent. Everyone is doing the same thing as they are. So how do they actually provide a, a meaningful and uh, um, a valuable differentiation from the competitors? It's all about experience. If you think about it, um, there's nothing much more than we could do because the, the battle for feature features doesn't take us anywhere. It doesn't take us very far away because it's just a matter of weeks, sometimes even days before a competitor actually implements the same thing. So we've lost our valuation. The whole idea is actually now we can actually, it's much harder to replicate the experience around the product than it is to actually do the product. The product is very easy to make. I mean, most of the products can be made in China, the physical ones. Uh, to replicate a product itself it, or a service is very easy. You can just set up a shop the next day. But to build a whole experience around it, it's, that's much harder because then you need to actually think about it. And you, you, you've probably come across a lot of services that are just mimicking other services, but they fail to execute them. Why? Because they hadn't had the thinking behind it to understand what the experience takes them. Um, th there's a very nice article that says that economies right now are fundamentally becoming less about the physical objects and more about creating ideas and experiments and generating emotions. Um, one of the, best the most interesting things that I think about, it was actually the other day I was in the gym, and I was thinking about how the gym is not actually not a very pleasant experience, but it still works. It generates an emotion connection to myself because I actually get a lot of sweat out, I actually get a lot of pain, but after I leave, I'm actually very, feeling very well about it. So it, not necessarily all the experiences are actually good, but it means that actually we need to, to think about how we design our products and services and generate emotions towards the other persons. Um, this is actually where I rip off the title of the presentation. Peter Pierre Merholz from Adaptive Path, he put a presentation, I think, in 2007, which he called Experience is the Product. Um, and this actually basically changed my mind because I, at, at that point in time, I understood that more people were actually thinking like me. So it was actually kind of, uh, okay, so I'm not that crazy as I thought about. Peter actually gave me two very nice examples. One was about Target uh, and how they actually redesigned the whole packaging about the, the medical uh, supplies because people used to mix up the, 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 um, the medicines between themselves within the family. So they developed this very nice system about actually having colors around the taps so that you know that you were blue, your grandmother was pink, and you never mixed up the, the pills again. Um, one of the other examples that he talked about was actually about how Kodak came to be. Kodak came up in a time where actually people, was, was very hard to make photos. It was very complex. It required a lot of professional tools. And when, when, when Kodak actually was invented, what happened is actually they, they created a new service. People could actually take photos by themselves 
and pass on that film to someone else so the rest, the complex part, was taken out of the user. Um, years later, Edwin Lan actually came up with Polaroid, which is it's kind of strange because if Kodak was trying to remove the complexity out of the user, Ed, Edwin Lan actually brought it back in a sense that you, now you can have a camera that does everything. You don't need to actually get your film to be processed somewhere else. Um, so in a sense, both of them created new services around the same concept. It's two very similar products, but they, they result in an entirely different experience. One is in instant photography, which became an icon on pop culture. The other is photography itself, which Kodak basically took over and actually allowed us all to actually start having pictures. Um, one of the latest products that I found that actually captured my attention was the Five Fingers. And I think it's brilliant because I remember the day that I actually saw the first ones, and yesterday I was tell telling this to a friend here. I was in Copenhagen in a cafe, and suddenly from the window I saw a guy actually wearing them. And I, I just said to my wife, what is that? Uh, because it looked like a skeleton feet. It was very strange, very awkward. I tried to get out of the place just to ask him what it was, but I couldn't find the guy. So for three or four months, I actually searched the internet trying to find out what the hell was that thing, and I couldn't find them. So, in a sense, it captured my attention. It played with myself for the product itself. But Vibrant Five Fingers actually had a revolution behind them because they actually are kind of the epiphany of the movement of the barefoot running. So people actually want to run as natural as possible, and this is what they incorporate these days. So it's an experience beside the product itself. Um, between actually... If you think about it, we've been a long time behind us talking about these topics, and most companies will tell you that they have an experience strategy. Uh, and that's the reason why I put this picture here, and I'm missing the notes, but uh, uh, never mind. The idea is actually that a lot of them think that they have an experience strategy. They don't have it. Um, I've been living in Germany for four years, um, and I, I know that actually in Germany people like numbers. So I've been digging up uh, to try to find some stats around what is... Uh, where are we today in terms of experience design, in terms of service design within the industry? And when I found, it was actually quite shocking. So 80% of the customers will tell you that their customer experience is the top priority. Okay? It sounds, it sounds good. It's a good number. I mean, it's very high. But the reality, and 76% uh, and of them actually will tell you that they want to differentiate between the experience. So everything sounds very positive. But interesting or not, then the numbers start crashing down. 70% will tell you that they want to improve their experience online. 59% wants to improve the experience cross-channel. Not bad, more than half. But then 46% want to improve their mobile experiences. Well, the numbers could be better. Um, and it's interesting because 42% um, of them actually say that they experience their, their strategy for the online part, for instance. It's on, only 42% actually say that it's actually somehow correlated with, uh, with their experience strategy at all, which is a bit, a bit strange already. And I also understood that very few companies actually know what their users want or who they are. And this is the most shocking one to me. 64% of the companies that have been interviewed on this study actually do have customer segments. So they actually spend the time to try to do a user study, which is already remarkable. But interesting or not, only 25% of them actually recognize that their company actually operates to those customer segments. So it means that someone did actually do the study around the users, but very few people within the company know who they are and why they work for them. Interesting or not, actually 62% of the companies say that they have a solidified brand. Even within the very high brands in the world, actually, you'll find that very few of them actually do have um, the brand driving the experience design, which means that they actually say that they one thing, their mission and their values is one thing, and their product is actually something else, which is to me is a disaster. Um, oops. Um, the good thing is actually, it's tough. I mean, I can understand why companies ended up this year with, with, the, with the, 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 the users going more and more online, requesting more and more, going cross channels, starting a, a, a sale process within a mobile website and ended up picking up on the store. It's complicated. So it's very hard, it's very new for companies because companies have been under a lot of pressure. They have economical factors behind them that they need to make more money. But also because the users, we are actually becoming increasing, increasingly demanding. We want more, we want faster, we want an instant verification. It's very hard. Um, but the good story, and that's why we're here, is actually it can only get better. <laughs> so for most companies, it's actually it's one step away to actually getting much better. It does require strong will and energy,
because companies are both very hard to change courses, okay? So within most of the companies, it's actually very hard to stop doing business as usual. So you need to actually put up something in place. Um, this is also very cliche, but I think they actually need a good strategy behind it because companies do operate with a process. So we need to actually put up something in place that allows them to start thinking about service design, to start thinking about experience design, to start actually thinking what they're actually providing in the end of the day to their customers. Um, being that it's no longer an option, the, 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 the end, if you actually don't change it, it's bankruptcy. It's actually being dead. A lot of companies actually face this. You've seen the news of how many companies have been thriving one year only to find that two quarters later they're having massive losses. So it is really happening. It's not something that we can just talk. It's not theory anymore. Bankruptcy is a fact. I mean, we've all actually been witnessing what happened with Nokia. They used to be the biggest brand. They used to make a lot. They still make a lot of money. So it's not very fair that, not to say they don't make money. But it's this whole idea that they're no longer referenced as the top leading in the market. And this happened very quickly if you think about it. Um, so to me, and personally, this is the advice that I've been giving to a lot of companies. Just get a strategy. I don't care which strategy. I don't care which process. Just get a process. Get something in place. Uh, choose whatever picking. Choose whatever, whatever model you prefer. Whatever thing that actually your employees actually are more fond of. Create your own. Improve, change, whatever. Just get something in place. Um, and then start actually making the right questions. So the first thing that I actually will actually tell anyone is actually get your basis around who you're serving. Who are your users? Um, what are their contexts? What, what do they really want? Is it actually what you're serving? Or you just happen to be as close as possible to what they need? Because sometimes we just use a service because we simply couldn't find something that does it, does it better. But suddenly someone taps it into the market and they give you something better and then you lose all the clients. It's very easy. Um, even if you know what they want, do you know what they need to actually do it? Do you need, do you, do you understand entirely what they need to actually, for you to actually provide them the service? Uh, is it something that they have on their own? Is it something that you also need to provide? As soon as we actually start making these questions, it's impressive how many uh, 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 loopholes and, and holes you actually find within their own strategy. It's, it's a very simple process that to me personally, after all these years, actually sounds astonishing simple. But most of you probably know that actually once we start asking these questions, everyone will be like, that's really clever. We hadn't thought about it. Oh, that's interesting. Let's put that on the slide and then let's make a presentation to the CEO. Um, to talk about users is really to actually not talk about ourselves. Um, even, even I actually, I am constantly challenged about my own beliefs and actually what is the actual, the, the actual experience. So sometimes I actually do put myself in, in, a, in a role of a, a user that actually belongs to a consumer study. I actually go there as a user instead of being me doing the consumer study. Just to understand how, how broken even the, the research process can be. Um, so it's not really about you and you need to think about it. I know it's a cliche to actually talk that don't talk about you, but you need to make a conscious effort to actually not talk about it. The second thing that we need to remember about users today is actually they are in control. Whoever tells you the opposite was completely wrong. Users are in control because they're now more demanding. The transparency and, and um, honesty is a reflection of the web values. People are used to the internet, they expect more transparency from the companies. You can no longer hide little details. You cannot lo no longer have the tiny letters in the end of the contract. Those things actually don't work. So you actually need to think that they are in control. You're providing a service or you're giving them a, a product that they will use. One of the examples that I think is very interesting to actually bring on uh, users to your process is actually what I've uh, uh, experienced with Philips. So Philips actually developed a program two years ago, I think it was two years ago, where they actually uh, uh, use a social, uh, social web experiment to collect research. So they've been actually scouting how people actually um, were cooking at home, what, how did they get the food, uh, where did they bought it, how much time they actually process it, and they brought this scene as a research study for themselves. But it was interesting because of doing the traditional way, which was to actually go to the homes of the people, they actually did it online. So they managed to actually collect insights from very different parts of the globe, which ended up in a product that has just been released, which is the home cooker from Philips. I don't know how successful it is, but it's a, it's a valuable effort from Philips to actually try to bridge with a new lead of consumers. Um, so yeah, if you, if you research a little bit about it, it's actually, there's actually a design brief about the whole process behind how they actually made it. The second thing is actually what, what do our consumers want? What do they need to accomplish the tasks? I would actually ask you because I don't have my notes or timer if you just give me some like five minutes before. <laughs> Otherwise I'll lose. Um, 
So what, what do they want? What do they need to accomplish the tasks? And what do we need from them? Um, one of the best examples that I had is actually while I was working at Portugal Telecom, I did a lot of usability studies for them. And one of the things that I always said is actually, do we really need to actually have a form for registration with 34 questions or something like that? Do we need all that information for them to actually start actually operating with us? A lot of companies think so. And I love the concept of actually progressive disclosure, which is actually, we can, we can start asking. We're building a relationship. You don't meet a person on the first night and ask for his entire life. You, you go step by step. You get to know your consumer. Every time that he calls into your customer support, just ask one more question. Start filling in the profile. You don't need to ask that up front. People are not threatened if, if you actually just take that approach. Get them as a, as a client, as a user, as a customer before you actually start questioning his entire life and his family. Um, the other thing is actually to understand where does these actions take place, which channels. Uh, this is also very crucial for most companies because we need to prioritize. Budget is very limited. So we want to provide the best experience, but where is supposed to provide the best experiences? I mean, Facebook is filled with rotten uh, uh, social media, um, whatever they want to call it, from companies where they just have a page. They want to have a page because everyone is on Facebook. But for their brand, it might not make sense to be on Facebook. Why do I want to be on Facebook if the brand has nothing to do with Facebook? It's just for me to do a like on the page and never come back there. I mean, is it really valuable? Do we need to invest a lot of money for that? So these are the questions that I actually ask companies when they start thinking about their experience design. Maybe you should put all your eggs in a better channel, because if your consumers are online, then go online. But if they're not, just go where they are. Um, IKEA is actually probably the best and most cliche example where we actually know how the contest has been designed for the, for the customers. Because from the moment that you get there, you have a place to drop the kids. <laughs> Because uh, they understand that actually you have kids, so you cannot live without the kids, but you need to bring them along, but maybe you can just leave them while they actually do the important business. And the whole thing, I mean, the whole process of IKEA is actually an experiment. If the next time you go there, if you haven't done so, because I've done it multiple times, not, not going there, but I mean just go there with your research eyes and actually start thinking about the little details, why things are where they are, just do that. It's, it's actually a brilliant example. The other thing is actually, while we're talking about the experience and the interactions with our products and services, to find the make it or break it points. This is the most crucial part of actually doing the research. You actually to understand where you're actually losing customers, where you're actually gaining customers, because that's where you want to put the money. That's where you want to make the most valuable interactions with them. Because if you actually manage to make it, you can actually convert to break it to a make it. Um, and also learn how to say no. I mean, companies are not supposed to delight the users all the time. One of the myths about service design and experience design is actually everything needs to be as perfect as possible. No, it doesn't. I mean, I give you the example of the gym. I go there to be mistreated. I mean, I go there so that I can get my ass kicked. I don't go there just for them to actually give me a pat on the back, to have the best, uh, I don't know, showers or whatever. I mean, I go there because I want to be put to, to the tests. Uh, so the companies need to make the same thing. They actually need to say no sometimes and understand that this is a broken experience, but it needs to be that way. And a friend of mine actually used to say that no one can sustain to be high all the time. So think about the customer experience. It's nice to have lows because people will appreciate the highs. But if you're actually constantly high, some, some sooner or later they will fall. And then, how do we live by it? Um, this is the question about the brands. Brands say that they're simple, that they're transparent, that they love their customers. They, they do all these fancy words, which actually sometimes are very empty. So the thing is actually, how does that actually, our mission and our values reflect on our experience? Is it really true? Are we really simple? I mean, I've seen companies saying that they're simple, but then they have a 34 process of registration, where actually needs, I mean, it's like you, you need to give your, your firstborn son before you can actually start g getting into the system. So try to understand how you can actually deliver those. Um, I think, as, as Chris was saying, that one of the tools that actually we have most brilliant is actually the customer journey, which allows a lot of people, a lot of people within the companies, to understand how we're going to deliver it. But it's also very important to try to understand that it's a limited scope. Limit the scope, because sometimes I've seen companies, they want to go for the whole customer experience. They want to do the whole shebang. They want to go from... From, uh, from, to, from the awareness process to the actually to stopping the service, like all the process. No, start small, start doing one bit by bit. The combination of all the bits will take you there. And please remember that experience is actually the sum of all the interactions. It doesn't happen just because you actually provided a great service. It happens from the minute that the user became aware of you. Because he liked the, the, mag the magazine ad, but he also liked the way that it was treated on the phone. So all this actually adds up 
to providing the experience, okay? Um, one of the things that actually very few people actually think about is actually that experience is emotional. We are emotional beings, okay? And to play with the senses, it's exactly where we should be. One of the, th the most interesting things that I found out lately is uh, what I call psychology, psychology acoustics, for instance, where people actually try to understand the reaction of certain sounds. I used to commute a lot to London, and there's the Heathrow Express between, Pad between Paddington and Heathrow uh, Airport, and they have this nasty sound loop, which is supposed to be a quiet zone of the, 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 the train, and it goes end and then and then, and it's a 15-minute ride, but I tell you that by the sixth minute, I'm already stressed. So not everyone actually will react to the sound the same way or the smell the same way. And I actually, I mean, there's a lot of shops that actually have their own patented smell. You go into the shop and they have their smell. Someone thought about it, the experience of providing a smell. Five minutes, thanks. <laughs> Let's close this. And remember that a great experience is consistent and repeatable, but not boring. It tries to orient and teach. People like to learn. We love to learn things. So if somehow you can, you can con convert an experience into something that actually it's meaningful and actually teach me something, brilliant. A great experience will become part of my life. It's simple, but generates, okay? It's, uh, so I don't know if you're following my, my thinking. Um, a good experience puts you up challenges. It's like the gym. I go to the gym because I want to be challenged, but the reward is actually I get a nice six-pack, which I don't, but uh, anyway, it's, I'm still trying to do that. And a great experience allows people to communicate with you. Experience is a, is a bi-directional thing. You need to actually be in communication. Um, so I'm going to speed up a little bit, but one of the most interesting things that I keep saying to everyone is actually have a good story behind your experience. A good story takes you very far. It takes you internally because your, your employees and your colleagues will actually understand what you're trying to do, and it also comes out reflected on the outside. If the story is actually lived within the company, outside it's, it's a reflection of what goes inside. A lot of companies want to be simple, but then their internal processes are completely chaotic, so in the end, the consumer will actually understand that. These days, it's impossible not to. So your story needs to be simple. It needs to be unexpected, because it needs to actually provoke something in the consumer. So otherwise, it's just boring. Um, and one of the most interesting things that I say is actually, I remember this when I was still a web developer, I think, some very years ago. This is the typical user base uh, uh, curve. You have the, the beginners, the intermediates, and the experts. And then the experience level within the features that you have on your product. And uh, the, the more advanced you are as a user, the more features you use. But the sweet spot is actually this, this pink, uh, it's pink on this screen, the pink area, where you want to put most of the features for the most of the users, but keep something for the very advanced users, because you want to have them continuously engaged. I work for a company where they were very good at the beginners, but as soon as people actually start being more, they just left. So this is a problem. Um, so, sorry for me to actually skip the slides. <laughs> um, I was going to talk about Zappos, which is another uh, 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 cliche, uh, but, but I will not talk about it. But it's interesting because Zappos is very well known for the customer experience that they provide. They have like this 10 amendment rule that every employee actually lives by. And the thing is, actually, they have a brilliant story. I will not talk about it, uh, but they have a brilliant story about a lady who, who actually happened to have lost someone, and they need to return, some, uh, return a pair of shoes. And instead of just accepting out of the, the, the within the dates that were supposed to make the return, they accepted it, and they even sent flowers back. So it's a very well story about how you capture the emotion of a client in a very bad period. The change starts within, so we need to move away from the sales funnel, and I'm really just closing in, and going into what we call the experience cycle, which is a cycle, it's not a funnel, it's a cycle. Because as soon as the consumers get to the end, they're in the beginning again. So they're actually up for the process again. It's a continuous feedback loop. Everyone comes in and goes out. Don't think about actually, because the goal is no longer the sale, but it's about value, binding a relationship with a customer. A valuable customer is a promoter cl client. It's someone who talks about our service who gives us value in the end. They will buy more. They will give us premium opportunities to charge them more. So you don't want people to just make a sale. Sale is not the goal anymore. The goal is actually a relationship. And remember that your team is actually built with different people, so they need to actually operate in synchronous. I mean, from the marketing team to the product team to the development team, everyone needs to breathe the same air. They need to provide the same thing. 
if, if one of them actually has a different vision of the values, it doesn't work because I'm a, I, as a consumer, call to the support line, but then the web page says something else. So it's a complete messed up. Make sure that actually your team is completely aligned. It's like, I don't know if you try to do this exercise of roaming with some of your friends. If one of them doesn't row correctly, no one goes anywhere. So it's, it's really interesting because it's a very physical experiment. The last note, because this is actually the last slide, is about the financial drivers for what we are here today. Why do we want to design our services? Why do we want to design experiences? We do have financial drivers behind it, and we need to remember that actually we operate on money. Most of the companies operate because we operate on money. So we have an increased revenue opportunity if we design the experience correctly. We can make more money. We can actually sell more to the highest consumers. If I'm very happy about the service and they want to charge me for five euros more, I actually do it. My bank, for instance, charged me a little bit extra, but every time that I call them, I don't end up on an automatic line. I actually end up with a person. And this is just like two minutes before I press the one, press one to do whatever, press three to do whatever. I actually go directly to a customer support assistant, gets my thing done in one minute, and I'm actually willing to pay for that. So the bank is actually charging me more just to provide me a better service. So it's a possibility. Um, I put this picture here because that's the motto that I live within. We need to remember that actually most of the services is really about serving people. M every one of us actually experiment the position to be served by or served. So we need to remember that our companies exist to serve the others. It's really, it might seem a very simple principle, but that's the whole thing about it. Is actually, if you put yourself in a position that you need to serve, you will always serve with a smile. Because and when you're a consumer, you expect the same thing. So it's very easy and very emotional to actually manage it. So, obrigado, which is thank you in Portuguese. Sorry for the time. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. No worry, I, I know how it feels. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you touched uh, a, a lot of really interesting and important points. Some, some of, of those parts, they deserve actually a, a talk of its own, like yeah, in, yeah. in their own respect. Um, so we have time for one quick <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, I did that well. <laughs> Just, it's a good strategy. Yeah, yeah it's my strategy. <laughs> But so, you can ask me anything afterwards anyway. Of course. Um, anyone? R Reto? <laughs> He's like... <laughs> but please, please. This must raise questions. <laughs> yeah, what? Last chance. Last chance. Well, thank you very much, Pedro. And... Um, one, yeah, I was very intrigued by this, this notion of the broken experience, yes. but I, I, I missed the, uh, the example. So you were saying that we can't be high all the time, I yes. agree, mm -hmm. and, uh, but can you explain again more in the, in the relationship with, with, uh, with a company what that means to you and, and well, whether you yeah. would say we have to design these breaks or these surprises well, I'll, I'll, or yeah. whether they are just there? They are just there. I wouldn't say that. I, I, I don't think we should design a poor experience just to actually give him a high afterwards. I don't think that actually works that way. But part of the processes are inherently bad. For instance, no one actually likes to pay for anything. The, the, the moment that you actually need to pick up the credit card to pay for something, there is a very bad moment for say. And you don't need to actually make it more than it is. It's, it's supposed to be a bad moment, but you can actually make it better for some, for some way. So there are moments in your, I mean, not all the services, for instance, I'll give you an example. When you get a car crash, it's necessarily a bad moment. There's nothing you can do about it. But the way that actually insurance companies deal with the call once you call them for assistance makes the whole difference. Um, there's this car sharing, because you mentioned car sharing. It happened to me that I took one of the car sharings in Dusseldorf to a party, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and I couldn't open the car anymore. The car simply didn't open, and I was in the middle of nowhere. And I called the lady, and the lady was just like, oh, uh, there's no one in the office. Um, and this was 2 o'clock, and I said, this was the last thing that I wanted to hear, because I was in the middle of nowhere. It was a bad moment, but she could actually made it better. But it was necessarily a bad moment. It's a moment that I actually need assistance, for instance. Um, it, there's nothing you can do, and sometimes you don't want to do it, because it's what you give afterwards that actually make it a very good moment. Um, that's what I wanted to say on, the, on my run through the slides. <laughs> cool. Thank, Thank you. you, Pedro. Welcome.